some people are standing, but that's okay. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Anna Berry. I'm the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of New Hampshire. And we're honored to welcome you to the fourth annual Global Business Summit, presented in partnership with Southern New Hampshire University. The World Affairs Council of New Hampshire is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization promoting understanding of world affairs since 1954. The council works across all sectors to prepare the Granite State for a global future. This means we're creating and sustaining international connections that enhance our state's cultural, economic, and civic life. We're building global knowledge and understanding through educational programs for communities and schools on foreign policy, like this one and furthering the development of emerging international leaders in partnership with the U.S. State Department. When we started the Global Business Summit four years ago in partnership with the SNHU Business School, we believed that the summit could be a unique opportunity to bring together business leaders, policymakers, community members, and students who are our future entrepreneurs to discuss international business issues and New Hampshire's future within the global economy. Since then, we've had conversations on innovation and entrepreneurship, U.S. economic competitiveness, and local businesses going global, issues that affect New Hampshire's economy and issues that affect all of us. But what does internet freedom have to do with business? Well, as you'll hear tonight from Google leader Ross La Jeunesse, everything. Not only does the internet contribute trillions of economic value to countries around the world, but local businesses are no longer just local. To thrive, you must think globally. And as our panelists will highlight, internet freedom and cybersecurity challenges are already affecting local businesses and their clients. So thank you for being here tonight to be a part of the conversation. I'd also like to thank the sponsors and patrons of this year's Global Business Summit for standing behind our critical mission. The World Affairs Councils of America with grant funding from Google, Southern New Hampshire University, Dine, Business New Hampshire Magazine, McLean Law Firm, Merrill Lynch, Hypersoft, Granite State District Export Council, the New Hampshire College and University Council, Carolyn and Stuart Richmond, and Andrew Suplee. Thank you. Thank you also to the 12 partner organizations listed in the program for helping us to advance the state. And we'd also like to recognize some special guests here this evening on behalf of our congressional delegation. Scott Merrick, representing Senator Jean Shaheen. In the back there. <laughs> Matthew Bartlett, representing Senator Kelly Ayotte. <laughs> Olga Clough, representing Congresswoman Carol Shea Porter. And Jake Berry, representing Congresswoman Annie Custer. Thank you. Finally, I'd like to note that the World Affairs Council is celebrating an incredible milestone this year, 60 years. I know what you're thinking. We look pretty good for 60. We don't look a day over 30, I'd say. Um, but actually, we do believe our mission is even more vital now than it was in 1954 when we were founded. International challenges we're currently facing, and they seem to be piling up every day, from ISIS to Ebola, are no longer isolated. Our world has never been more interdependent, and challenges for just one country can challenge us all. So if you believe, as we do, that global education and understanding is the key to peace and prosperity, both here and around the world, please help us sustain this critical work. Join us as a member, make a donation, Join the conversation by coming to other events or meet the world by hosting an emerging international leader in your home, office, or school and help us create a more peaceful, prosperous world through international exchange. And I'd especially like to thank everyone who's helped us reach this special milestone, our loyal members and our board members. Now I'd like to welcome Bill Gillett, Dean of the Southern New Hampshire University School of Business to introduce our keynote speaker. Bill? Somewhere here, hold on. I would like to, while I'm trying to find my cheat sheet here so I don't get the titles wrong, welcome you all to Southern New Hampshire University this evening. 
Uh, this has been a tremendous series uh, done in partnership with the um, World Affairs Council, and we are delighted tonight to have a very uh, engaged, interesting, and exciting keynote speaker. Uh, Ross Lajeunesse leads the global team responsible for advancing Google's work on free expression and open, open internet issues, as well as their relationship with international organizations. And in that position, he is uh, one of the if, if we could simply go around the country and find the one person we wanted for this, uh, he really fits the bill perfectly. Um, he is also probably the answer to the trivia question of what single thing contributed to the career and public success of Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Senator George Mitchell, and Senator Edward Kennedy. Um, all of them uh, worked, uh, I, I, I probably shouldn't say under him, with him uh, at one point or another in his career. Uh, and so he has had a, a very interesting path before he came here, uh, here being to Google, obviously not, not here. Here, however, uh, he is from Arundel, Maine. Uh, he spent his undergraduate time at Dartmouth, uh, his graduate years at Harvard Law, and I feel like all of those he's sort of been triangulating, trying to get to the center, uh, which is in fact Southern New Hampshire University <laughs> in Manchester, New Hampshire. Uh, and so, Ross, welcome. Um, before he comes to the stage, uh, we are going to show you a short video uh, from Google on, uh, I think, specifically what he is doing and, and the initiative that he heads up. I have the right to speak freely. The right to press the record. To search. To find. And to share. To press play. The right for anyone to talk to everyone. About whatever you want. Gay marriage, Super Bowl season, dessert, family dynamics, to post, the like or dislike, debate. I have the right to celebrate my grandchild's birthday, sing my songs, to tell the war how I feel. We have the right to be heard, to date, to fall in love, to get married. <laughs> we have the right to create together, discuss, to assemble, protest, party, and pray, pray. wherever. It's about connection. Freedom of expression. Openness. These rights are what make the 21st century the 21st century. But not everyone shares this right. Those must have the internet. They have the freedom to tap you. They can't access information without fear of being silenced. We can't like, share, blog, post like we do. And five billion more of us are coming online in the years to come. It's only right to protect their rights. Their right to click whatever button they choose. To share fear. Triumphs. Love notes. Manifestos. Will we have that right tomorrow? Will our kids have that right tomorrow? Will all seven billion of us have that right tomorrow? We have the right to record. Play. Like this month. Debate. We have the right to speak freely. Hey, everyone. It's great to be here, and I want to thank the dean for that really generous introduction. I do feel in many ways like, like I am home. Uh, as the dean mentioned, I grew up in Maine, about an hour and a half away from here, and my parents are in the audience tonight. That makes me especially... <laughs> now, that makes me especially nervous. I, I've given this speech a couple times, but never with my parents in the room, so I better do a good job. That's, how, that's the feeling that I'm feeling right now. Um, it's really great to have all of you in this room because the key message I want to leave with you tonight is that the work that my team and I are doing at Google uh, is work that can't be done alone. We need all of you to engage and we need all of you to be a part of it. Um, but before we get to that key message, I want to start off really by uh, telling you a short story about my niece, Eleanor, who's five years old. Um, she's a cutie, uh, <coughs> and I know that I'm not, uh, you know, I, I'm a little prejudiced in her favor, but so, so Eleanor is five years old, and she, she lives in Georgetown, just, a, you know, a, about a mile away from my house, so I, I have this really great situation where I can go hang out with her and my sister and her family, and we were watching TV one night, and we were in, in, in the den, we were watching football, 
And sort of out of nowhere, Eleanor goes up to the television screen. And she puts her hand out. And she swipes the television screen, <laughs> right? So you know, in her mind, why wouldn't that television work exactly the same way that an iPad works, or a tablet, or a mobile phone? And that moment said more to me about what's happening with technology and with our world than any TED Talk or any Time Magazine article or anything you'd read in the New York Times. You know, and the, the strange thing is that Eleanor's perspective is right. Why shouldn't that be the way things work? You know, because for Eleanor and her generation, that one connected screen, and there'll be many of them in different shapes and sizes, but that one connected screen is really all that she's going to need. Um, for her, there won't be this thing about the pre and the post internet age. There'll just be the internet, and, and then there'll be history. For, for her, there won't be these concepts about new media versus old media. There'll just be what's online, and then there'll be history. And for her, there won't be traditional workplaces versus modern workplaces. There'll just be connected workers, and then there'll be history the way things used to be. When I try and, if I were to try and tell her about typewriters or phone booths or TV antennas, I'd sound a lot like my grandparents did when they talked about horse-drawn carriages and getting big blocks of ice and taking them to the icebox. So Eleanor's only going to know one world, and it's, and it's an exciting world, and I think one that we all want to be a part of. It's, it's a world where when she goes to see her doctor, her medical, rector, her medical records will be securely in the cloud and accessible immediately. It's, it's the type of world where any type of programming, entertainment, any type of news that she wants is going to be available to her whenever and wherever she wants it. But the most exciting thing about all of this is, as we all know, there'll be things in Eleanor's world that we can't even imagine right now. Because every day, there's a new application, there's a new way of doing business, of getting customers, a new way of communicating, and a new way of falling in love or doing any other, any other number of things that we do in our lives. It really is a matter of science chasing science fiction at this point. And, and the race is neck and neck. So tonight, I want to talk a little bit about, about the future of the internet. What, what I think it means for America, what I think it means for Google, and for the rest of the world. But I want to start off by spending a few minutes talking about how, how we got here. So about two years ago, I was, I was in Asia, and I moved back to the United States. And I was going through you know, one of those boxes that's crammed full of stuff. And to be honest, it, move, it goes with me from move to move, and I never really open it or figure out what's in there. But, but I went through this box. And there was an old AOL CD-ROM, right? And I think some of the students don't even remember those. But you know, they were everywhere. You know, they'd fall out of magazines. They'd be stuffed in your mailboxes. Sometimes you'd use them as coasters, you know, randomly. You know, so they were they were everywhere. And the AOL model was: if you signed up with AOL, you would turn on your dial-up modem. And you heard a noise that was really strange. And, and then you heard the famous, you've got mail message. And, and just by the way, those modem connections were 20,000 times slower than a fiber connection, like Google Fiber, that you can get in certain cities now. 20,000 times slower. Now, AOL wanted to be as big as the internet is today. At its height, in 2002, it had about 27 million subscribers. And it was a, it was a pretty smart business model. Uh, you had a monthly fee. Uh, they had partnerships with content providers. There was advertising, and there were chat rooms, and there were games, and, and so on. But just as those services started reaching the peak of their popularity, uh, the internet took off. And now the internet is much, much different. It's a different model. Unlike paid services, the internet was free and open. No one controls the content. And the internet's design let anyone plug in 
who wanted to do so. And, and that's pretty much what happened. The New York Times plugged in, the University of California plugged in, the Mexican government, the Vatican, museums all around the world, Buckingham Palace, the stock exchanges, Twitter, everyone plugged in and everyone started connecting with each other. And they were able to do that because the internet is by design free and open. And it took off like wildfire. And closed networks like AOL started to falter. And there was a bit of a struggle for a while, but we're all clear about who won that struggle. And simply put, the internet grew and has become the most powerful communications tool in human history. And it did so because of its, of its elegant infrastructure, its structure, its free and open. In 2000, there were 300 million people connected to the internet. <coughs> and today, not only does it reach almost 3 billion people, but it connects all of them to each other directly. And as a result of this, there are now hundreds of millions of media outlets, if we count everyone's social media page as an outlet, as we must. Each minute, there are over 100 hours of video, each minute, posted to YouTube alone. And those numbers are very similar across all sorts of other platforms. So, I mean, this is certainly an entertainment revolution. Amateur rockers post a homemade video, and the next year, they're on tour of the world. Cat videos can sometimes capture audiences larger than American Idol. But this is more than just an entertainment revolution. Let's think about what else has changed. Bloggers hold politicians accountable to their promises. Students in Brazil can learn physics from world-class professors in Australia. Researchers here in New Hampshire can connect with colleagues all around the world to work on projects together. And at the end of the day, and I think this is really the most important part of all this, there's no one sitting in a corporate boardroom or in a movie studio or in a government building dictating who can say what to whom. It's the ideas and the art themselves that rise to the top or crash and burn. It's the ideas themselves that provide that power, not someone else. It's the audience and the people who are speaking who actually decide. So there are two different people who illustrate this point, I think, especially well. In the opening video, you might have seen this girl. Her name is Martha Payne. She's nine years old, and she lives in Scotland. So Martha would go to school every day and get served really crappy lunches. They were beige and bland, and they weren't very nutritious, and nothing was really healthy about them. So what she started doing She's pretty precocious. She started taking pictures of her lunches and posting them online to her own blog. <laughs> now, her blog became incredibly popular and started this whole debate about these lunches. And so people started complaining to city government, saying, why are our kids getting these crappy lunches? And of course, the city government does what every good politician would do. They banned Martha from posting photos, <laughs> right? <laughs> But that's exactly when her movement took off. When the city government tried to ban those photos, celebrity chef Jamie Oliver got involved. And her global efforts, her efforts really became global. And the city council was forced to reverse its ban. Today, Martha is a global advocate for nutrition and for fighting poverty around the world. And that's the sort of power that the right message and the internet can provide. And I think about what things were like when I was a nine-year-old and my ability to speak to the world and how limited that was. You know, if I were really fired up about something, I might write a letter to the editor about something, right? And if that newspaper publisher thought that my idea was smart enough or interesting <coughs> enough, he or she might publish it. And then, it, and then my message would get to like maybe two or 3,000 people at best in my hometown. But now, someone like Martha can speak to millions of people because of the internet. Now, as great as that story is, not all of these stories uh, end up the same way. 
So this is Bassam Youssef. He's a cardiac surgeon in Egypt. Bassam saw the, the Daily Show with Jon Stewart. One